Hello and welcome to this video presentation titled Simulating the Surveyor 1 Final Descent. My name is Bart Hertog and I will be taking you through the progress White Label Space has made on its simulator for the thermal descent to the moon's surface. The goal of this simulator is to be able to estimate the propellant requirements, mission constraints and in later stages use it for controller design. To validate our simulator, we have implemented a real-life case, the first American moon lander, Surveyor 1. Surveyor 1 landed on the moon on June 2nd, 1966, as preparation for the manned flight of the Apollo program. NASA has published a lot of data on this mission, as you will see during this presentation. During this presentation, the following points will be addressed. First, we will discuss why Surveyor 1 can be used as a comparison, followed by the assumptions we have made to simplify the simulator. During the terminal descent to the moon, the lander performs a maneuver which is known as a gravity turn. Implemented in the simulation is a velocity control system which is active during this gravity turn, which we will also discuss. And in the final stages we will discuss the result and conclusions. So why did we choose the Surveyor 1 mission as our reference? Well, the dimensions and properties of the Surveyor lander are in the same range as those of the White Label Space Lunar Lander. Surveyor used a solid retro motor to brake on the final descent, and so will the White Label Space Lander. After this retro motor burns out, it is jettisoned, leaving the veneer engine to control the remainder of the descent. So, let's point out these engines. This is a schematic view of the surveyor lander during its launch configuration. You can see that it is inside the fairing of the rocket. Uh, this is somewhat of an odd picture because well, we're discussing the final descent, but it's the only picture I was able to find in which the main retro rocket is displayed. As you can see, there it is, with most of it inside the body of the lander. Besides the retro motor, we have, of course have the veneer engines. Surveyor had three veneer engines, and this is a point at which it varies from the white label space mission, because our lander has only one veneer engine, which is gimbaled over two axes, so it still has enough control freedom. And as you already guessed, most likely our retro motor is not inside the body of the lander. The terminal descent. The simulation starts at about 100 kilometers above the lunar surface, that is at this point. Uh, the lander is oriented toward the velocity vector, uh, that is the thrust of the main retro engine is along the velocity vector. And for the remainder of the flight that will be controlled so that it is along the same vector. So at one point this main retro motor will ignite and 40 seconds later it will be burned out and at this point the, it is jettisoned. The veneer engines for survey they were already active in the white label space case they will become active at this point and they will control the remainder of the flight up until 13 feet or about 4 meters. At this point the veneer engines will be shut down and the lander will free fall uh, onto the lunar surface, at which touchdown will occur. To simplify the simulator, we have made five assumptions. First, we assume that the mass decreases linearly. That means it is uh, related to the first setting with a constant parameter. Second point, for the main retro motor we have assumed a constant thrust. It is shaped like a block for its own, uh, entire burn period. Third point, we have only implemented the velocity control system of Surveyor 1. The attitude control system is mimicked by a scheme which will be discussed in the following chapter, gravity turn. Fourth and fifth point will be discussed with some images. So first, the flat moon assumption. 
we assume that the moon is flat, as you can see on the bottom, it is not round. Uh, this uh, saves some uh, problems and allows us to only use one location axis system, which you see also depicted in this picture. So those are the first two degrees of freedom the spacecraft has. It can move horizontally and vertically. The third degree of freedom is the attitude of the spacecraft. So here you see the point mass, which represents the spacecraft, and you see its two main body axes. And relative to the vertical, we define the attitude angle theta. Now, how to land with a minimal velocity at the lunar surface? At the initial altitude of the simulator, um, which is about 100 kilometers, the velocity is about 2.6 kilometers per second. An efficient way to remove this speed and to reach zero velocity uh, in both the horizontal and vertical directions at touchdown is by performing a gravity turn. Not a strange coincidence is that this is also the maneuver that rockets use when launching a spacecraft into orbit. The same basic physical principles apply, what goes up must come down, even if it is on another celestial body. The name gravity turn already hints at the lander performing a turning maneuver when under the influence of gravity. The lander initially approaches the lunar surface at an angle. Uh, in the case of Surveyor 1 this was about 6 degrees, but its design could go up to 45 degrees. Now remember that the goal is to have the lander oriented correctly and without any horizontal velocity at the point shortly before touchdown. Under the influence of gravity, the lander will accelerate towards the surface. The total velocity factor will thus, at some point in time, be oriented directly towards the lunar surface along the gravity factor. Now, the most efficient way to reduce the total velocity is to have the thrust pointed directly opposite toward the velocity factor at all times. As mentioned earlier, we have assumed that the attitude is controlled to an optimum and we have the team come to that in a few seconds. And in the current version of the simulator, we have therefore a algorithm which rotates theta towards the vertical. And now the equation to perform this is this equation. So it's a differential equation which depends on the velocity in the horizontal and vertical direction and their uh, derivatives. When starting to implement the surveyor case, I was not expecting to be able to perform an accurate simulation of the control systems, uh, but luckily I was able to find a document on the NASA technical report ser server which details the actual design of the control system. So that was quite, uh, quite happy with that. Um, this document is called Surveyor First Phase Flight Control and it's written by O'Connor and Mark Bach. The surveyor landers, they were built by the US Aircraft Company and this document dates 23rd of April in 1964. The velocity control system consists out of two velocity uh, or two control loops. Uh, the first loop is an outer loop which controls the velocity and the inner loop is a, the loop which controls the acceleration of the spacecraft from this loop, the Vanier engines get their set point. So let's take a look at the outer loop, the velocity control loop. Now this is an actual image from uh, the document. So as it dates uh, from the 60s, it's not that well visible. But uh, let's go through it in a clockwise direction, starting with the set point. So on the top, we have here two options for the set points and I'll discuss that now. So the big block in this is a lookup table. Uh, it's a lookup table which relates the measured slant range to uh, the desired velocity. Well, it's a lot of big words, not to worry. I'll discuss the lookup table more accurately later on. Important to know at this point is that it defines the required speed for a certain altitude. The switch on the right in this highlighted block switches to a fixed 
pi feet per second set point uh, is not important for this presentation. What is of course important is the subtraction uh, from the measured velocity. So from the bottom there is an arrow upwards which is the measured velocity. This subtraction uh, results in the error signal which is fed into the actual speed controller. So the speed controller, this is a basically very simple. It's only a linear P controller uh, with a gain called KV. Uh, K uh, being the general term for a, a gain and V for velocity. The output of this controller is however limited. That's the second block and that's not, well, it's not that interesting. It's just a limit so that the first controller goes not out of uh, range. Of the, set, uh, of the maximum capabilities of the uh, veneer engine. The acceleration is obtained, the set point for the acceleration loop is obtained from the velocity controller. This is not the most accurate representation of the, of the velocity controller. I have a more a clearer picture later on. But first, discuss the remaining blocks. So we have here the geometry, which is basically the physical equations. So this would be part that is uh, gravity for instance. From that block we obtain two measurements. Uh, one is the velocity and the other one is the slant range towards the lunar surface. Um, the dynamics of these sensors are it's basically a low pass filter which uh, have everything above 10 Hz is filtered out. Surveyor has a radar system to determine the velocity and the range. It's only active uh, from a certain point, but also not important for this presentation. So, let's take a closer look at the acceleration loop. Uh, this is a more accurate block diagram. The controller on the top left is indicated as shaping. The full name they have given this is a shaping filter. Uh, this is filter is required because the veneer engine does not behave as a simple low pass filter as indicated in this diagram. So you see the top middle block is a low pass filter. No, uh, even this diagram is simplified because the engine had problems with uh, hysteresis. So to overcome this hysteresis they have added this shaping filter. For in our simulation we have neglected the hysteresis and therefore also reduced the size of the shaping filter. So an interesting thing to note is that the dynamics of the accelerometer is more complex, but also still, it's just a second order filter, low pass filter, uh, which has, uh, allows everything above 30 Hz to pass. As mentioned earlier, I would come back to the lookup table. So let's see, as you see, it's a lookup table, uh, which has a graph in it. And this graph is defined by the following equation. So the range depends on the measured velocity, uh, the, a max parameter, the maximum acceleration minus the lunar gravity constant. Um, in the case of surveyor, this maximum acceleration was set to 12.58 feet per second. It's basically a value that limits the output and allows everything to be stay within range, such as engine limits and sensor limits. I did, however, find that the value that is mentioned in the design document varies from the curves that were found in post-flight documents. This hints at a slightly different value for AMAX in the final implementation. So it could mean that during the design some parameters changed slightly, but interesting to know. Continuing with the velocity range diagram, we can depict the actual results from the surveyor flights. In the published post-flight uh, graphs, we see the linear approximation segment, the predicted path, and most important, the actual measured descent path. These graphs are the only source for in which this data is available, as far as I could find. So, by using a ruler, the data was obtained and used to generate comparison graphs with our own simulation. This is the full flight path or flight done in our simulation. You can see in blue our flight path, in pink surveyor, uh, plus two additional uh, data points in green and a red velocity slant range curve. So 
let me get back to the additional data points. These were estimated two and a half hours prior to touch time. So they are not actual flight path data points that have been received over radio uh, telecommunications. This is the reason why I think that these vary more than the other points, because uh, in, when we zoom in into the final phase of the flight, we see that the resemblance is uh, very good. We have a very close uh, match between surveyor and our simulation. And this is the, even the last stage of the flight in which you can also see that obtaining the data with a ruler might not yield steady results or they might actually vary this i cannot tell you but for what i what i think of this is that still a very good match uh, let's continue with some more uh, quantitative uh, analysis in the post-flight documentation a uh, number of events have been timed and we can of course in the simulation also obtain the time and as you see this overview states that within 2% plus or minus we obtain these events. On the bottom of this slide you see the total burn time of the veneer engine and that varies slightly more about 3%. And then we get one of the key goals of our simulator was to be able to estimate mass requirements for our own lander. Uh, so this is an important number. We can estimate the veneer propellant consumption within 3.2 uh, within 4 percent. So this is quite reasonable if we were to estimate our own propellant requirements. Finally, uh, this, however, is somewhat more of a debate. The thrust level. So the post-flight documentation states average thrust levels during certain flight phases. And as you can see, this is quite a ver variation. This is a point of attention uh, if for future uh, progress on our uh, simulator. The conclusion of it all is that we have an accurate velocity range curve, accurate timing and accurate propellant use, but less accurate for us. This was our presentation on the progress we have made with the Surveyor Fly 1 case. I thank you for your attention and hope to see you next time.